What up, everybody? Scuff D here, and, or should I say, Scuff McLean. It's hot. It's summertime. I've got my tank on. That's the way it goes. It's hot outside. Uh, so, we are going to do another card-by-card -card reboot. We're going to take a look at some of the card-by-cards of a faction that we've not seen, uh, that we've not done a card-by-card -card recently. A lot of the core sets, actually a good majority of the card-by-cards at this point, the games, the factions have seen updates and changes. So I think it's worth time worth mentioning and taking a look at those factions and how have they evolved how have they uh fared in the environment and what cards still have value what cards uh lack value we're talking about the world eaters today the world eaters faction as a faction people are in one of two camps either a they don't want to see the world eaters they're tired of the world eaters because their world eaters just play one certain way. Or they're in the camp where they want to see the world eaters receive some adjustments and play a, either a different way or some, change some things up there. You get one of the two. You never have somebody down the middle that's like, eh, well, you know, I mean, maybe a little bit here and a little bit there. It's one or the other. Uh, the world eaters, uh, when I first did the card by card and following quite a few, I have received numerous changes. Almost all of the changes that the World Eaters received since when I did the card by card a year and a half ago have been in the side of nerfing or reducing the impact, uh, lowering stats and effects of cards. They were very powerful, aggro, aggressive, direct damage, direct brutality, much marking the, the, the way the playstyle works faction, and the cards echoed that almost too much to the point that they were very uh, fast, very furious, and before you knew it, they could outclass a lot of other uh, uh, cards. Well, they've received changes. They've received redu reductions and nerfs to cards. Um, how does this look? How do they look now? We're going to start out with the Warlords. First off, let's take a look at Angron. Now, Angron received one change. For those who don't recall or those who weren't playing from beta all the way up until about August of 2019, uh, Angron was, or 2018? 2018, probably. August of 2018, Summer of Angron, was a ferocious time where he just straight had three attack. There was no plus one or plus oh when you have no troops in play. He was just berserk, three attack, which made him very formidable. Um, and it just, it was brutal. His whispers never changed. His whispers was always been the same in terms of, you know, when he drops to one health, you can play his whispers of chaos. And then he becomes this brutal monster for attack with bloodthirst which is basically eight damage usually enough to win the game one change that he received on his demon prince form though was he used to have immunity to stun he no longer has immunity to stun that was big that was huge because basically once he became demon prince you had to kill him before he could kill you you couldn't delay the game if you stunned angron and he went to demon prince he could shake off the stun and win the game as well Angron decks, and I did a, 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 a kind of a one-year anniversary of, of uh, receiving my own Angron because it took me forever to get one. I actually ended up having to buy the alt art. That was the only way I ended up getting Angron for quite some time until I finally picked one up in the packs. And uh, he he's not bad. He's, 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 he's had to change and adjust his deck types. You can play him with troops with little... Uh, uh, less effect with the direct damage, but he can receive some support. And there's so many tactics that have been added to the game that deal damage, direct damage, uh, stun, uh, removal. There's been Orders of Terror. There's only, really only two cards that remove stun that are neutral cards, um, and he can make use of the tactics ones, avoid engagement. He plays very much the same as he did before, uh, although with the fact that he doesn't can't use troops to get that plus three attack it kind of shifted his deck type into that mono warlord for the most part um but he's still a primarch he still works he doesn't work as dominating as he once was because there's so many other warlords and playstyles and other cards that support it and at this point people kind of gotten used to uh playing against him you know how to play you know how those games are going to go you know what you have to do early on and you know what you have to kind of be wary of as far as what his lethal range is late game and if you don't it's a learning experience now shabrandar has received various changes um i like shabrandar as you can see i've played quite a fun quite a, quite a few many fun games um 
his ability has changed a couple times. He recently received, and when I say recently, I mean like four months ago, five months ago, received this little passive when he's damaged in combat, he deals one damage to a random enemy. He still lacks 35 health. There are only a couple epic warlords that do not have 35 health. Shabrandar is one of those. Um, however, his impact should not be uh, should be, not be minimized. I have a lot of fun with him. He actually is the one world eater character that is not necessarily actively anti-troops, but inherently anti-troops. Angron deals direct damage or damage to whatever it is that he wants to attack, namely your opponent's warlord. Karn attacks as much as possible, hopefully to your opponent's warlord. Erlin, who we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about deals direct damage straight to your opponent's warlord. Shavin Dar is a little bit more flexible, does a little bit of splash damage with his ability, does a little bit of splash damage with his passive. He's very good at drawing out or controlling a board um, or keeping the board on your opponent's side minimized and actually making use of other World Eater's cards. Out of all the Primarch, or out of all the Warlords for the faction, he is possibly the most flexible to build around. But as you see, as we get through the rest of the cards within the faction, we'll go deeper into that as far as what does that flexibility actually mean. Now, Erlen is kind of like your cheaper version. For quite some time, he was the cheaper version of Angron. He has high initiative, which was great. He used to also start with an additional card, which was huge because he's got 30 health. His ability deals three damage to the enemy warlord. And that's just straight. Doesn't matter if they're stealth or not, he's going to be able to do that damage. Um, and then on top of that, you throw in the World Eater's cards, the fast, the direct damage, the same kind of tactic approach that Angron uses, and you can chew through the health of an opponent's Warlord very quickly. That additional card in hand at the start of the game was very powerful for him in terms of setting up the combos or choosing, making sure that you've got a couple key supportive cards in hand, such as Armor of Mars. Uh, the fact that he lacks that now has slowed him down some. He still has high initiative, and that's still great, but lacking a card... Uh, at this point, it, it, it does see some impact in terms of the reduction of his ability. Um, he's not bad. He still plays very good. Angron, I think, at this point, plays a little bit better now than Erlen did. And then there's Karn, who is everybody's fan favorite. Um, in terms of ability, his ability has never changed. This has always been his ability since day one. He's had Bloodthirst. After attacking, he deals one damage to random unit. Now, his artwork has changed. His artwork is actually... Uh, it's an improvement. I mean, I like the old, old Horse Heresy image artwork where it doesn't even look like World Eater's armor. Uh, it looks like some sort of, uh, uh, thing from, I don't know, you know, like Elder Scrolls or, uh, some other, it's like some weird hybrid. I don't, I, I can't even think of as far as like picturing like where he could come from. It just didn't look like a World Eater's, uh, uniform. This does... So the artwork looks better. Uh, he's got an alt art as well, which is unusual. There are not too many epic warlords who have alt arts somewhere in the game, but he does have one, and that's actually got a little bit more of a dynamic pose to it. Uh, but uh, his, his ability is very functional, straight, straightforward. Attack, attack, attack. You don't have to attack, though. You do not have to attack with Karn. Um, I, way back when, I did a deck list with Karn, and it has not changed much. It's not suffered much. The game is very much the same. For the world eaters, for the most part, the game plays the same for these guys as fast. Uh, they play the same. Angron and Erlen have seen a little bit of impact. Erlen probably more so than Angron. Now let's talk about the cards within the faction. Drask Scouts. Now these guys here, they're one twos. They're not fantastic. Uh, you see them in, in event decks, but they actually play a very good role uh, with a couple of combination cards within the, the faction itself. One two, not fantastic. Backlash drawing a card. That's a good. That's a good backlash ability. You include these guys with a card like Sedition's Gate, which we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, it's self-explanatory. You're paying four energy to destroy a random troop, and you're drawing a card. You're getting exchange, and it's very cheap and affordable and easy to do. It's a cheaper hard removal, especially if your opponent only has one troop on the board. At the very least, they're a threat that your opponent has to worry about because you could very well follow up with a sweep in advance on your next turn, turning that 1-2 into a 4-2, drawing a card and replacing the card that you played. So it's entirely possible to gain something out of them. Um, I like them with my Dar deck. I really do because I've built my Dar deck as a card drawing machine to cycle Armor of Mars. 
Um, but that you have to know what you're playing. You have to know how you're building your deck primarily, and you have to know how and when to play Jurassic Scouts. Gladiator Group 27 is an epic card that costs one energy and gives all troops in your hand drop pod. Now, the benefit of this is it gives all troops in your hand drop pod. That does not matter if they are vehicles. It does not matter if they are world eaters, mechanicum, imperial army, demons. They get drop pod. That's a great ability for one. The problem is that's it. That's all it does. It gives them drop pod. And in a faction, whereas we'll see some of these troops down the road uh, that wants to damage its troops, it doesn't make sense to protect them. And as a faction that doesn't do anything with Drop Pod, this feels like a complete waste of a card. I would pass on this in the shop unless you absolutely need to complete your collection. This is not going to do anything for you. Uh, if you're making use of this in your deck, then you either have got something very specific in mind or you're looking to fill a void or a space. In terms of the one drops, in terms of one drops, Strike and Fade is probably your best one to go with. It's a direct damage. It draws a card if you kill the target, which is very easy to do given the various splash damage effects of Shabrindar or Karn, as well as drawing a card for Angron. Uh, it's not very hard for your opponent to have a troop with one health left. It's also very useful because you can use this to damage your own troops and your Warlord, often used in combination to give Angron his Whispers, or in used in combination with troops like Wraith and... Uh, why am I spacing on his name today? Argus Brond. Um, you can turn those guys into monsters with the Strike and Fade. So Strike and Fade feels like a very, it's a common. It doesn't seem like it does a lot, but within the faction, it actually synergizes very well, and it is worth including uh, having two of those. Now, Cardock, if you are new to the faction itself, you don't have a whole lot of cards, this card is okay. I feel eventually as you your collection grows, you should replace this card um, with other cards because generally you're paying two to heal two to your unit units but typically with the world eaters your units consists of just your warlord so you're paying two to heal two to your warlord there are other cards within the game now at this point in time that do a lot more for the same or slightly marginal more cost here's an exact same this is a higher rarity it's a rare but you heal two and you remove stun from a friendly unit, which can be your warlord. You've also got uh, Pi Alpha, who instead of costing two, costs three, but it heals three and removes stun from your warlord. And you also get a troop in play. So now Pi Alpha, that's been since set one. That's not been any different. That's a launch card. Uh, but in terms of tactics, Cardock is okay. It should quickly be replaced with something else. Keth bikes uh, appear every now and then. I feel like they're if you if you are starting the faction, you're going to get these, and they deal one damage like as a frag grenade effect. They can work in a pinch. Um, they're not fantastic, but if you are looking for something just to spread damage across the board, they are a way to do it. A Keth bikes, in addition to something like an artillery strike at six energy, you're basically doing three damage to up to three enemies, uh, possibly killing some depending on how you time it. Keth bikes with. Shabrin Dar seem like a good idea because for four energy, you're dealing two damage to the Warlord and three damage to adjacent units. But the problem with it is um, they're, they're just so fragile. I like to get a little bit more out of it, out of the deck. So, I mean, you can mix it and match as you are. They're not bad. Learn Squad used to be very good. Uh, I like these guys as a rare. They just kind of felt like they fit in any World Eater's deck um, because when the enemy Warlord attacks, you drew a card. And at the time, a year and a half ago, uh, most Warlords attacked. There was only a couple Warlords that used abilities, such as Erlin or uh, Loken, uh, that actually used abilities to damage. So they attacked. So you were going to get cards. You're going to see repeats out of this. As time has gone on, there are a lot more Warlords who do attack, but there's also many Warlords who don't. And so Slurn Squad has kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, you could build a deck that includes them, but I feel that you probably are better off passing on them, putting in some other support card or attack to get two energy. Stole Squad, these guys are just a straight 2-3 unstoppable. It's a decent common. Nothing great, nothing fantastic. It has not changed at all. I think the artwork might have changed some. Um, but that's it. Sweep in Advance is still a good card. It's not fantastic, but in the pinch you can turn a fast troop in a, from a 4 attack to a 7 attack or a 3 attack to a 6 attack. For two energy more that's not bad that's almost doubling the uh, the impact of that card depending on what, what you're using it for if you play sweep in advance in conjunction with argus brond 
uh, making him a 7 attack, and then you ping him once or twice with Strike and Fade, he becomes a 14 and then a 28 attack. Very easy to make Sweep and Advance uh, friendly. If you do not have a lot of troops in your deck, though, if you're only running with 4 troops in your deck, like an Engron, Sweep and Advance might not actually be that great, because up until you draw a troop, it's a dead card in your hand. And if you play a troop and you don't have a Sweep and Advance in your hand, then when you draw a Sweep and Advance, you have to wait till you draw another troop. So um, it has its moments. It has its moments. Now, Throne of Skulls has changed some. Uh, they gave this Mark of Chaos and Berserk to your Snarty troops before. I think it just gave Berserk to your Snarty troops, uh, or just Mark of Chaos. It didn't get both. And it cost three. Now it costs two. But... There aren't many good Astartes in the World Eaters faction. We're going to get into that as we go through this. This card is a pass. Uh, the artwork is neat. The idea is neat. It would be fantastic to have several Astartes in there, but a lot of the cards that you're going to see the World Eaters play are actually either vehicles or their tactics in neutral cards. And Throne of Skulls is not going to do you any good. Uh, aggressive Tactics is okay as well. Um, in a pinch, you could draw you know, two to three cards, depending on how many damaged enemies, and that includes your opponent's Warlord that is on the board. But there are better card draw options in the game as well now. There's like Tissue Divinatus. There is Void Engagement. And those don't have to require your opponent's troops to be damaged. You can draw two. You can draw one. You can play Abandoned Supplies and draw a card that costs less. You can play Supply Lines and grab, grab a vehicle that costs less. You can play War Room now and grab a tactic that costs less. So Aggressive Tactics... It just feels like it feels like it's been left behind. Barsk Squad has uh, not changed at all. They're three four. They've got that Berserk. They've got that one Rage, deal one damage to random unit, which fifty percent of the time ends up being your Warlord. Um, they're okay. They're not great, and I probably would pass on them in most of my decks because of the three attack and because of that one damage that pings. If it damaged an opponent's troop or, uh, yeah, just an opponent's troop, I'd be happier with it. But the fact that it's any random unit just doesn't feel great. Butcher's Nails. I want to like this card. I want this card to be functional because it's so thematic to the faction. But it suffers in the same way that the Throne of Skulls suffers. It gives Mark of Chaos and Berserk to your Stardust troops. This gives plus 2, plus 0 oh and Berserk to your Stardust in play and in hand. But you have to have Astartes in play and in hand. Not saying that there are not some Astartes in decks that play well. It's just not going to happen as often as you would like. At the very most here, you might get plus 2, plus 0 to 2 troops. One being on the board. When you could just pay for 1 energy less to sweep in advance and get plus 3 to that troop that's on the board and get an immediate impact. The Berserk doesn't do anything. Berserk is not a positive. It does nothing for you. So I want to see more from that card, but it's just not fantastic. Crash Bikes are the same. They haven't changed. They're 3-3 Bloodthirst. That's it. Can very be very powerful if your opponent doesn't respond to them or fails to respond or forgets to respond. You can turn those guys into 6 damage, or if you throw a sweep in advance onto them, you can turn them into 12 damage. But it doesn't happen that often because all they have to do is deal this one damage to the crash bikes uh, and they can kind of break the impact of that bloodthirst. They're not bad as a starting card if you're trying to build the card pool. They're decent common. They're a target. They draw a fire away from your warlord. But as time goes on, they are replaceable. They're very replaceable. Sark land speeders are not replaceable. Um, four too fast. These guys either deal four damage to a front line, to a troop that's going to kill you, uh, or just straight to your opponent's warlord. There's nothing wrong with that. That's an even exchange. Three, three energy for four damage. This feels like a solid good card. I would like to find some ways, and there are ways, but I'd like to find a few more ways to give shield or increased health to vehicles you play. But within the world of your faction, that's just not likely. Your best bet is maybe getting like a, a Mark of Slanesh from No Survivors when you play a Seraph Land Speeder, and then you've got a four attack with Sneak Attack. Um, and we've talked about Seditions Gate. Now, I still like this card. It's still kitschy. It destroys a one of your troops, and it destroys an enemy random troop. But you get to choose which troop of yours that it's destroying. And if you've controlled the board to some degree, you know what troop it is going to destroy from your opponent. Um, very functional in Dar. I think functional to some degree, maybe in Erlen, um, not so much in Karn. Karn's, at that point, you should be playing more damage cards. I don't think you should be needing to, to do a hard removal for four, but as a one-of, it's not bad. 
Um, it definitely works very good in a Dar deck, though. And like I said, if you combo that with a Drask Scouts, then you are drawing a card and you're not losing anything. Raw and Veterans are still good. These guys used to have three attack to begin with. Now you now have two attack. Uh, and they were they were pretty beefy in a uh, Karn. You could drop these guys on three, and Karn attacks, and they become a 5-4. Just like that. Now they become a 4-4 four, four, uh, if he doesn't ping them. There's still some debate as far as how impactful that is, but if your opponent doesn't respond to it, you throw a swoop in advance down. They can they can do their they can do their share. They're not fantastic as as they once were, but if you're building Karn, they go in. If you're building any other warlord, they don't. These guys, because uh, Angron doesn't really want to play the troops, so there's no reason to include them in there. And the other two don't need to attack necessarily, so there he's going to just be a two four. So pass. Lork Squad, on the other hand, oh, these guys used to have 5 health, I believe, if I remember correctly. The art changed a little bit. I think they shifted the frame. Uh, but the ability, I've always loved this ability. It's very simple. They're, they're not fantastic, but they're unstoppable. They're 3-4, and the fact that they deal 1 damage to a random enemy, which, as I said, Bar Squad could deal 1 damage to a random enemy troop uh, and be almost as valuable. Uh, you can turn these guys into just from an attack on your opponent's warlord. If all they have is their warlord out, this troop is doing four damage, maybe five damage. And if you ping them once or twice with your own cards or your opponent's cards have damaged them, they're spreading that damage out more. You can get a lot of value from Lork Squad, and there's no reason if you're running troops not to pass on these guys. I would like to see them back up to five health or maybe even four attack. That might seem like a lot. But within the faction as a whole, it's not asking much because they don't have much to offer. We're just in the forecast. We're just entered into the forecast range. And I've already just taken a hard count on cards of pass on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'll count Crash Bikes as an okay card. Nine cards. We've already said, eh, eventually you're going to pass on this card. They need to have something within that cost range to be functional. You shouldn't have a third of the faction just at this point in, in, in the cost passable. No Survivors is a good card. This is an epic card, but this is a good epic card. Uh, it deals two damage across the board, so it's better than Artillery Strike because it's going to deal more than three dam more than three units. And then for each unit killed, it gives a Mark of Chaos to a friendly non-demon troop, which late game is very possible to get uh, four Marks of Chaos. I've done it a couple times. It's always fun when you drop a troop or you have a troop already on board and you turn it into, you know, a, a, a Yuri of the Seducer or a, a Destroyer of Worlds. Uh, and all you have to do is pay for energy. It's entirely possible. Um, but just in terms of being able to use it to deal two damage across the board has got the value. This is a good card. This is worth having two of in your decks. Uh, Wraith used to be a 3-3. Three, three, or actually, he used to be a 4-3, and then they dropped him to a 3-3. Three, three, now he's a 3-2. His ability has remained the same. His rage is he puts Wraith's Berserkers in play, which is this unit right next to him. These are guys that are 4-4s four with Berserk. They used to be a 5-5. Five, five. He used to be probably the best epic or legendary in the, in the faction. Uh, his value, if you could get him out and ping him once, it was enough to buy you time to really swish the put the put the the pressure on your opponent. You can still ping him once or twice and get that value, but it's much harder to do. His impact is not as huge. Um, I would like to see him kind of return to some degree, or like even if they just bumped up the Wraith Berserkers to a five five and left his stats as it was, you would get some more impact from that. I understand why they did it. Uh, he's still very playable in you know any any of the the non Angron builds because they're going to run troops and you put a troop down that has to be dealt with, right? But in terms of value, um, not as great as he once was. Now, if you could get if you could get a if you played like a pseudo troop Mechandrite build, right, with Zainai seventy three, and you were lucky enough to generate one of those uh, wonderful tasty Mechandrites that gives him some additional health the Medicaid Mechandrite, then you could turn him into a pretty decent uh, Berserker pumping machine because then he would have five health. That's technically two to three attacks uh, as well as potential pings, and that's that's a lot of Berserkers hitting the, the field. 
You could do that, but you have to know that you're building your deck for that, and that's just one card. That's not a card that you can have two copies of. So Wraith has suffered. He's still worth including in some in in, in basically every world leader's deck because he costs four. He's easy enough to throw out, except for Angron. Um, there's an argument to be made there where you could throw him in an Angron deck, and, and he'd be okay. Roth land speeders, I like these as well. They uh, you have to kind of draw them out. Vehicle hate is still exists in the game, um, but as far as a uh, cleave three, that's a that's a body that needs to be dealt with. Otherwise, your opponent really cannot put anything else on the board. Uh, otherwise, they're going to suffer losing those troops for for no exchange. So this is a good four cost card. Um, I think the four cost definitely. I mean, it, they're they're small. There's only about five of them, but that's really where you get decent uh, value for the exchange for your troops is at that four cost level five you're going to get argus Braun, who is again a legendary card but he is a good legendary card that artwork is angry that's always been his ability doubles the attack of his troop that's it and it's very quickly to make him a monster he generally does not last enough to use his attack or use his attack more than once but when he does it's worth it um I'd like to see him get a little bit more play, but at the same time, I'm fine that he doesn't. Uh, there are other cards within the faction that I think need much more work than Argus Braun. I think Argus Braun does what he does, and he does it well. Gorechild is an epic that sees play in Angron for sure. Karn, and maybe you can make an argument for Dar. It's not necessary in Dar at all. Um, it's okay, and the fact that you can have two of them in your deck and give your Warlord technically plus two attack is very nice. But you've got to play it early on or on curve to get the most value out of it. Late game... Unless you're using it as like a finisher, a surprise finisher in, in a Karn, it's not going to do a lot for you. And you have to ask yourself, do you need to have two in your deck? Especially for a Karn deck, so we don't go beyond seven energy that often. Um, a five energy cost card is really going to be situational play. So it's good, but it's very limited. And I'm okay with it being limited. It hasn't changed in terms of its value. It's worth picking up. If you don't have one, pick up one at least, because you will find use for it. Um, you will find use for a Gore Child. You will find use for no survivors. But that's really, if you want to have two in your deck, you've got to have Angron to make the most of it, in all honesty. And it's not necessary, but you, can, you that's really how you're going to make the most out of it. Because, look, two Gore Childs on Demon Prince Angron, a six attack Bloodthirst... I, I, there's no, you don't need to say anything. Six attack, bloodthirst. Harl squad, five, five for five, five. And how many, how many jet packs does that guy have? The way this artwork looks, it looks like he's got four jet packs on his back. I don't think that's really the case. I think there's like some guys off frame, but this guy is jet packed out. Look at that art. Um, yeah, pass as a common goes is five cost. If you need a body, sure. But there are, there are better neutrals in the game. If you're playing fives, you've got uh, Duke Mortisher. You've got uh, several vehicles that work very well. You've got front lines like Skitari Protector. Uh, Harl Squad is not going to do much for you. In events, in event decks, it might work. Now, Monument of Corn is one of those cards you really have to know what you're doing with your deck. You have to build it carefully and specifically to get the value out of it. But, ooh, when it, when it hits and if it sticks... Uh, adjacent troops giving them plus two plus so that doesn't seem like a lot on the surface but if it sticks for free you just made your Seric land speeder a six too fast that's all troops that includes your your other your neutral cards your goldstone hunters that includes cards like jubach that your opponent is like yeah he's not going to attack with it well maybe i will because now he's a th he's a four attack um monument of corn you have to know what you're doing with it very quickly, though, it can become a beast and a monster. So, And I think actually uh, recently, I'm not sure if I had it in the game or against me or not, with uh, Bar Knight Legions. Uh, Bar Knight Legions um, against one of the players, uh, Death, who ended up uh, taking the, the Meodmeister title, uh, packed Monument of Karn with, with Nurglings. Very cheap, but then they become a 3-3. So what's not to like? Uh, speaking of Bar Knight Legions, we're doing that again Friday night july 11th it's happening if you're interested check out discord check out the announcement on um, barnet legions i'm going to put up another announcement on reddit just in case the last one was buried uh and we'll set that up that's a casual casual night of games playing a little a, a tournament some beverages some chatter on the uh on the discord uh vo voice line just a good time to just kind of discuss the game and uh, have fun with some some not so aggressive or i can't say aggressive not so uh super meta decks just play stuff that 
play play Dar, play Dar, play uh play Erlen or play. I'm getting I'm getting off track. I'm getting off track. Uh, Barnet Legions though that that's that's this Friday again. Now Skane Squad, I like Skane Squad. I've always liked Skane Squad. Their ability is costly. It always has been, but in the same way that the uh, Roth Land Speeder can just kind of hold a board. These guys throw down the threat to hold the board, and they've got six attack as well. They're susceptible to Ambassador Melgator, so they can be returned to hand. But if they stick, they can either deal four, or if your opponent has got troops on the board, they can help you wipe out all the adjacent units, on the on, or all the troops that you want to work out. And they're just gunning down those heavy bolters. Um, you'd have to throw them out in a deck that you want to do, like an early deck of them. Um, I think Dar makes use of them very well depending on, on who your opponent is and what they're playing. Um, but I like them. But we're at the five-cost range. And even then, that, that that ability costing four energy, when you've got other units in the game, um, just, let's just take a look at, uh, gosh, arguably so, three damage to an enemy and adjacent units. Let's just take a look at the Salamanders, because I believe they've got something that does the same for less, right? Uh, how about three? energy that deals four damage to an enemy and adjacent units uh, card cost two more is that the even exchange i don't know I don't, is that where the drawback is doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense it feels like that should be th it should be three to deal three that's just what it feels like to me uh armor of mars is the best card this faction has got hands down hands down it's the best card this faction has got. Um, you can you can include a World Leaders deck with only Armor of Mars as your legendary card. It's very budget friendly. Uh, if you see this in the shop, there is no reason not to pick this up if you do not have it. You will need it. You will be glad to have it. If you play it once, it's fantastic. If you play it twice, it's triple fantastic. If you play it three times, you're super lucky. Your opponent hates you, and yes, it's fantastic. Armor of Mars, best card that the faction has got. It has changed, though. This used to go right back to your hand and cost one more if you had no troops. So you could heal seven again for seven and heal seven for eight and then heal seven. It was situational, and as the games got on, it could be a little bit progressive, but it was even more infuriating. However, now it still costs six, and it can go back. So you actually technically can get more value out of it, although the possibility of you drawing it again is harder. And that's where cards like the uh, the, the, the Dress Scouts kind of come into play in terms of helping kind of thin your deck out. Um, a, a popular Erlen tactic with him was to have that extra card in hand, draw a lot of cards, get to like five cards in your deck, four cards in your deck, and just keep cycling Armor of Mars. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're dealing three damage to your opponent's Warlord for two. You cycle Armor of Mars, you heal for seven. You maybe throw out another tactic to deal damage. Um, his strategy has changed a little bit with, with that loss of the additional card, but it still works very functional in any of the wor World Eaters decks. Uh, again, can't say enough. That's the best card that this faction has got. Gorefather, I wish I could say more for. I think Gorefather is over cost for what it does. Cleave 2 is nice on a warlord who's always going to get cleave two. That's functional. It can be used. It can be used in conjunction with other cards to damage things and get rid of troops, kill a troop and still damage your opponent's warlord. Uh, it's deal with damage that are stealth troops that are stealth that you can't take. You can cleave into them, but for six cost, it seems like this card comes out or has the potential to come out far too late. If this was a four cost card, it might be too powerful. If it was a five cost card, uh, it would be arguable to rival with Gorchild in terms of is it worth it or is it not? And if your opponent doesn't play any troops at all, then this is a worthless card. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't give a rally effect. It doesn't heal you. It doesn't increase your attack any. It's useful, but it's super limited useful. And for six energy to deal two damage, cleave once or twice, you could just have two tactics in your deck like defensive satellites or artillery strike or uh, volcanic instability that deal more damage to more targets planetary purge costs six and deals four damage and can wipe a whole board out if you, if you set it up right so gorefather is is bad it needs to change it's it, do people play with it sure do they play with it all the time no 
Hidden Strength is not bad in event decks. Uh, it's nice to give plus one, plus one to adjacent troops. That's cool. But their low attack for six cost is really where it, it hurts. I feel if this was a five, six, or even a four, five, it might be better. It might see a smidge more play, but that six cost, at six cost, guys, at that point, the world leaders don't live that long. Most decks, I mean, you can get to ten energy. You certainly can, but most of those decks, the world leaders decks, the way the game has shifted, the other support cards that are offered by the neutral factions, um, they're so low cost that the six cost cards are few and far between, and those type of decks specifically don't make a lot of use of troops. So even then, I don't think Hidden Strength would benefit uh, many decks. Now, Lorg has some degree of benefit more in the fact that, look, it's an even 6-6-6, but... It also deals two damage to all units as a backlash. So even on its deathbed, it's still going to hurt things, which could hurt you, but it's also going to hurt your opponent. It's an even, even twist on the board. You don't lose more than they gain. Um, Lorg's not bad. He's a common. How is this common superior to this rare? It just is. It that's this is the uh, that's the 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 logical dichotomy of the world eaters. In the same way that the Morg Terminators are four six. A lot of Terminators in this game cost 6, and they start out, start out stats 4-6. Uh, their Rage, though, should be Rage plus 2, plus 0. I think that Rage got tempered down. I think they used to have plus 2, plus 0. I think they should gain more. I think they should come in at 5 instead of 6, but it is what it is. It's a, it's a card that nobody plays. You might have an event deck with a World Eaters uh, event deck, and you might have that. You might have an event deck that has Dort. Pass. Don't buy Dort. Don't buy for the Blood God. It seems like it's got cool artwork. It's got a cool concept. You will you will have to play a game where your opponent is letting you do this. Where they let you deal this this seven damage to deal two damage to all units. And if it kills five or more troops, kills five or more. That's a lot. Because the most troops that can be on the board is 12. So you have to have 50% of the board killed. The complete full board killed. You get a Slayer of Worlds. When you could just pay 7 for a common that deals 3 damage to all units, and then you get a draw cards just for however many you kill. There's not even a requirement there. You kill a unit, you get a draw a card. It doesn't make sense. It's In theory, in logics, in, in, in fluff-wise, this seemed like a good idea for a card. It's not. Pass on it. Don't pick it up. Nacer Varen. Oh, gosh. I, I, as far as characters go, I like this character... I want to like this card more. I want him to be more. I actually want him to have a, an ability that is basically seven cost. When a friendly, when a troop you own dies, reduce the cost of this card in your hand by one. Basically, kind of in the same way that you see something from the Emperor's Children, the Enhanced Warrior, right? Uh, this guy here, who went well in hand, he gets stats that go up, right? I would like to see Mace or Varen become super cheap. Uh, because your 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 troops are dying. That's what I would like to see. And then you could drop a two cost six seven stat and combine him with some other cards. I'd like to see that. He would get more play. It is it is it is a rare a rare exception when you see Maester Varen. Um, it just I want to see more of him and I don't. I want to see more Gorefather. I won't be I won't deny it. I don't. It's a it's a it's a hard faction. It's a hard faction to, to, to not feel as if they lack things. But if you give them too much, they become very dominant because of the way their playstyle works. Blade of Fury. You might come across this if you face the Erlen bot deck. That's it, though. I mean, that, that's a powerful ability. Here we go. Look at this. This guy's got a four energy deal, three damage to all enemies. So how is that better than this rare card that costs less, that deals less damage? I don't know, guys. It just doesn't make sense. It feels like the, there's a giant scaling here that should change. Now, Ghost, these guys are powerful Terminators. These guys can be brutal. I like this. If you could get them out cheaper or find a way to uh, give them shield or, you know, um, ping them up a little bit, you know, before they go into they could they could end games on themselves. That's not a bad rare. And I think in a, in, in a event deck builds, they could be functional. But really, for your eight energy card, the only card that people use and or need is the Conqueror. One to two, destroys all troops in play. 
For a faction that has, as we have seen, very few troops that you want to play in your deck, there's no drawback to having that card at 8 energy. Or 6 energy if you get it with an Abandoned Supplies or a War Room. The Conqueror is a good rare. If you don't have it, you need it. If you have it, include it. If you really don't want to be stuck with a lot of big, fat, nasties front lines at the end of the game, you probably want two. The Conqueror is a good card. Honor's Retribution is not a bad card if you want to talk about killing your troops. But doesn't come out that often. Uh, again, it's an Erland bot deck card. Um, I like the stats for it. I like the idea for it. It's it's very simplistic. The cost is not 10. Um, but it doesn't tie into how this faction plays now. The faction doesn't play troop heavy, troop dependent. It's just not going to matter. If you're if you're playing this at nine energy, then you could be playing so many other cards to win you the game. Uh, Battle of Glory. It's got frontline and it's got shield. That's it. I, again, this is an Erland bot one, and I think th the case could be made to build an Erland deck that parks behind frontline and uses his ability a lot, uh, very much in the same way that the bot deck does. <sighs> but it's a it's it's like one of those arguments like why would you do that oh there's that karn alt art i like that dynamic pose a lot better that's actually more his gradual descent into uh into the the, the corn you know he's lost the armor on his arms he's got the chains around it uh you can see his eyes he's got the skull starting to decorate um i like that uh yeah guys they've not aged well the world leaders as a whole the warlords as a whole function about the same minus one. Uh, Angron still functions well, minus one. Erlin still functions well, minus one. Karn has always functioned the same. Dar, believe it or not, can function very well. Uh, I like playing with Dar. I, I have fun with Dar. I have good games with Dar. But that 30 health is really what people set back. But the rest of the cards in the faction, guys, the only reason you see decks that look the same that play the same is because that's all they've got. And I really do feel like there is a, a necessary complete overhaul. Even giving some of these units flank, uh, lower cost, uh, better abilities, uh, not necessarily ward, but maybe a way to gain survivor or a way to uh, to deal damage or de you know rally effects. Something that's going to facilitate giving a reason to play these troops. Because right now, the faction lacks that. As as nice stat as cards like Mace or Varen can get, uh, as cool as the idea as Honor's Retribution can be, or even Ghost, uh, that's a great idea for a card. But the way the faction is really limits the desire or um, ability to really make it work as the game has progressed. The game is faster, um, and the game has got so many better neutral cards that can do more. At 8 energy, if I, if I absolutely must play a troop at 8 energy... Odds are I'm not going to play any of the world eaters. I will look more towards the neutral side of things. And if I must play an 8-energy uh, an troop, I want to play something that's going to have an immediate impact on the board. Now, that could be something like a Lernia Hydra. Uh, that could be something like a, uh, like a Doombringer, right? Uh, it's an epic. It has lower health, but immediately it's going. I don't have to kill my troops for it to deal damage. It's going to deal that to all the opponent's stuff. So it's just not... Not good. The The blood on their armor has rusted, has turned to a rusty red. Um, the gore on their axes is clotted, right? But they still fight. They still die. They still play. They still win. But that's the warlords that are really putting the work in. This is a faction that started out, you know, focused on how the war, warlords operate. I mean, they're aggressive. They attack. They attack. They deal damage. They attack. They deal damage. But the cards in the faction themselves don't support the warlords enough to facilitate and keep continuously including them. So as the card pool grew, as more damage cards grew, more tech cards like uh, Orders from Terra that allows your warlord to act twice uh, were added to the game, there became more attractive options to just simply enhance your warlord. Why not? Why wouldn't you enhance your warlord? If you can give him Survivor 5 with a Manifest Destiny, why wouldn't you? That's a great card. Why wouldn't you do that? Why would you want to throw a troop in there for a five cost when you could just do something that increases your warlord's ability or destroys stealth or uh, you know deals four damage across the board? 
I would like to see an overhaul. I think it's warranted. I don't know if it would change the play style for the faction because they are warlord focused, but I do believe that it would be beneficial to see some of these cards shape up. Arm of Mars is the only legendary you need. Unless you are looking to get a full set, you're missing one specifically, um, I don't think you need to pick up anything else. Wraith is okay. He's not bad. Brond is good. He's probably near number two. I would go Arm of Mars, Brond, and Wraith. In those, in those order, those are the ones worth getting. Until they do something different with Mace Varen, or unless you are a diehard Mace Varen fan, um, I'm just, I don't see a use for him in, in decks and builds. You can play him. People do. I'm not trashing those people who do. There's nothing wrong with that. I just, at that point in the game, I'd rather play other cards. I'd rather play multiple other cards than play one card that relies on more of my cards dying when I may not be running that many troops. So, yeah, yeah. They, they have not aged well. Um, there's a lot of cards there to pass on. There's a lot of cards there to pass on, but they still play well. Does that make sense? The faction hasn't aged well. The Warlords still play well because they're supported a lot by the neutral cards that are in the game. So that's it, guys. That's the reboot. That's taking a look at the uh, World Eaters. If you liked the breakdown, if you uh, had some thoughts or comments, feel free to put those in below. If you liked the video, please like it. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel or, or spread the word around. Um, I try to provide the, not just the card by cards, deck lists, concepts, breakdowns. If you're already subscribed, you kind of know what we go through. Uh, there's a lot of tech play. If you haven't checked out the training cage playlist I've got, if you're a newer player or you just kind of want to get some cerebral thoughts on how the game plays, how the how the things operate, there's a lot of stuff and discussion and concepts I've got there where it really kind of breaks down the card game as a game um, and as and the very various facets that we do in that. And I try to plug that as much as possible because honestly, I prefer discussions like that versus uh, knee-jerk discussions where people just get upset about losing to specific cards. Let's see if I can find a prime example of that here in the global. Vulcan is too good. Almost broken. Vulcan's good. That's it for me, guys. Until next time, keep playing Legions. We'll talk to you later. Bye.